In the age of power, a woman's beauty was the original sin. A beautiful woman is either the prey of heroes or a sacrifice on the altar of gods. Both men and gods kiss the power and bully the weak. Beauty is but the cost that builds their careers and achieves praised performance. Here is the story not only of how the beautiful castrated corpse became a stepping stone for the hero, but also of how the maiden who was tightly bound and abused on the cliffs of the sea is now in the sky, mocking the heroes of earth. Please follow me and subscribe to my channel. I look forward to you joining me in uncovering the meanness and cowardice behind the heroes, the so-called great ones. Follow the trail of destiny and gain insight into human nature and ideas and myths by our no will. In Greek mythology, the universe began with chaos. Chaos gave birth to Erebus, meaning darkness, gloom. Subsequently, one version says that chaos gave birth to Nyx, meaning night. Another version says that Erebus gave birth to Nyx. The mating of dark Erebus and night Nyx gave birth to Aether, which is the personification of the bright upper sky, and Hemera is the personification of day. This narrative is a metaphor for light coming from darkness and that day is born of night. This Epantus was born of the mating of Aether and Gaia, the first primordial god and mother of the earth. According to Hesiod, Pontus was born of Gaia's asexual reproduction. Gaia's fingertips also gave birth asexually to Uranus and then asexually to Ray. Then Gaia and her son Uranus gave birth to the twelve titans. Among the titans was Pantus, meaning sea. When the youngest titan, Cronus, had castrated his father, Uranus, Gaia had intercourse with her own son, Pontus, and gave birth to a son, Nereus meaning old man of the sea. Then another intercourse gave birth to Thaumas, meaning wonder, who personified the dangers of the sea. Then came Phorces, also a sea god. Two daughters were born of the union of Gaia and Pontus. The elder daughter, Sito, literally means sea monster. The youngest daughter, Eurybia, meaning wide force. It should be clear here that Poseidon is the king of the sea, who rules the sea. Pontos, the Titan, is the sea itself. The son of Gaia and Pontus, Nereus, the old man of the sea, represents the gentle and calm side of the sea. And his daughter, Sito, represents the stormy and dangerous side of the sea. And Phorces is simply the god who lives in the sea. In another version of the legend, he was king of Sardinia and Corsica, defeated in a naval battle with King Atlas in the Tyrrhenian Sea. After his death, he became a half-man, half-ram living in the sea. Atlas here is not that brother of Prometheus, but the king of Atlantis or Mauritania. The half-human, half-ram Forces was actually a monster of sorts, who mated with the sea monster Aceto and gave birth to a group of sea monsters collectively known as Forsides. Among them were the three sisters Gorgons, which literally means grim or dreadful. The eldest, Stheno, means forceful. The second, Uriali, means far-roaming. And the third, Medusa, literally guardian, protectress. The three sisters of the Gorgons are all beautiful and attractive creatures of the earth. The reason they became demons with snakes for hair began with the dispute between Poseidon and Athena. The founder of the city of Athens was Secrips, who naturally became the first king of the Athenian city-state. Secrips was also the founder of the institution of marriage. He expected the gods to compete, and the winner would become the patron god of Athens and receive a sacrifice from Athens. The competition was conducted by the gods giving a gift to the city of Athens, and the citizens of Athens voting on the winner. Poseidon struck the ground with his trident and made a spring of salty water gushed forth that brought trade and water to the Athenians and prompted Athens became a maritime power. Another version is that Poseidon gave the Athenians a horse. Athena went to the hill on the Acropolis and with her spear grew an olive tree, which she planted on the hill. The olive tree brought wood, oil, and food, and the olive later became a symbol of Athens' economic prosperity. 
Both gifts from the gods brought wealth to Athens. But mortals are subjective creatures, and they prefer to substitute their position for their minds, to substitute where their asses sit for rational thought. In the vote, Athenian men voted for the male god, while women voted for the goddess. Because there was one more woman than man in Athens at that time, Athena won and became the protector god of the city. The defeated Poseidon really lacked manhood. In a fit of rage, he flooded the Thrasia plain outside Athens and sank Attica to the bottom of the sea. Then one of his sons, Halorotheus, meaning sea foam, was sent to cut down the olive tree Athena had planted. Halorotheus did not cut accurately. He lost his life while his axe fell on himself. In another version, on the beach of the city of Athens, Halorotheus sees a beautiful woman, and without inquiring who she was, he raped her. Halorotheus has probably gotten used to raping beautiful women and bullying honest people because of his dad, Poseidon. Unfortunately, this time, Halorotheus was careless and hit the muzzle. No, he messed with the wrong god. The beautiful woman was Alcibi, whose father was Ares, the god of war and courage. Her mother was Aglorus, princess of Athens and daughter of King Secrips. Thus enraged, Ares killed Halorotheus. The enraged Poseidon took Ares to Zeus. The court of the gods held a trial on a natural rock outside Athens and found Ares not guilty. The rock became known as the Areopagus. It was here that all the trials for murder in the city-state of Athens took place. Poseidon decides to take revenge on the Athenian temple dedicated to Athena. In the temple, he found Medusa, Athena's beautiful priestess. The poet Ovid, whose full name is Publius Ovidius Naso, lived at the time of the founding of the ancient Roman Empire Augustus ruled. Augustus's full name is Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus, simply as Octavian. Ovid lived at the same time as Virgil and Horace. All of them rank among the three canonical poets of Latin literature. Ovid praises Medusa as a young girl with beautiful blonde hair. She was a priestess of Athena and swore a lifelong vow of celibacy to the divine virgin Athena. Seduced by Medusa's beautiful blonde hair, and in order to humiliate Athena, Poseidon raped her in Athena's temple. Although she was the daughter of Zeus, Athena did not have the courage of Ares to challenge the king of the sea. After enduring Poseidon's humiliation herself, Athena threw her anger at Medusa, who had been humiliated and ravaged, and cursed the three Medusa sisters to become horrible and ugly monsters. The blonde hair of all three turned into horrible snakes, and anyone who saw them would be turned to stone so that no man could ever come near them and have sex with them again. The two sisters of Medusa, who had nothing to do with it, were actually cursed, and there is truly no justice in the face of the arrogance and power of the gods. Aeschylus, the father of tragedy, wrote in his famous tragedy Prometheus Bound. Near them their sisters three, the Gorgons, winged, with snakes for hair, hatred of mortal man. Perseus does not know where Medusa is, but as the illegitimate child of Zeus, helped by the gods. Athena, not daring to challenge Poseidon, only dared to punish the insulted and injured Medusa. She handed Perseus a mirrored shield and told him that he could view Medusa in the reflection of the shield without turning to stone. She also gave him wings with which to fly and instructed him to go to the Grii and inquire about the survival of Gorgons. Grii, meaning old women, alternatively spelled Grii or Grey were three sisters who had gray hair from their birth and shared one eye and one tooth among them. They were the daughters of the siblings Forces and Sito. They were also Gorgon's sisters. They were also called the Gray Sisters and the Forsites. They entered their pale age with hardly any childhood, and the three of them took turns using one eye and one tooth. When one of them gave the eye to the other, Perseus took the one and only eye. In exchange, Perseus demands that Grii reveal Gorgon's abode. Perseus also demanded that they lead him to Hesperides, before returning the one and only eye to them. Hesperides were nymphs of the evening and sunset golden light. 
who were the daughters of the evening or nymphs of the West. They were also known as Atlantides, derived from their reputed father, Atlas, brother of Prometheus. The nymphs sometimes spell nymph. Nymphs were female nature deities, representing different incarnations of nature in ancient Greek mythology. They were immortal like other goddesses. Hesperides gave Perseus a kibisus, meaning bag or knapsack, that could use to store Medusa's head safely. Hermes, the herald of the gods, lent Perseus sandals with wings that would allow him to fly. Hephaestus, the god of blacksmiths and fire, gave him the adamantine harp that could decapitate Medusa. Hades, the god of the dead and the king of the underworld, gave him the helm of invisibility. Another version of the legend has it that all three of these treasures, which could kill Medusa, were also given by Hesperides. Perseus put on his flying shoes and followed Grie's instructions to the cave where Gorgon had lived. By observing Medusa's reflection in his mirrored shield, he safely approaches and beheads her. Medusa, when decapitated, sprang from her neck with Pegasus, a winged horse, and Chrysor meaning he who has a golden sword. Polygnotus was a Greek painter who lived in the 5th century BC, consistent with the description of the ancient Roman poet Ovid. Medusa is also a beautiful maiden in Polygnotus' works. Medusa was pregnant after being raped by Poseidon. Perseus cut off the head of the pregnant Medusa while she was asleep. According to some other versions, the beautiful Medusa's head only possessed the magical power to turn people to stone after her death, as killing the tender maiden in her sleep was rather unheroic. Perseus' heroic behavior has been repeatedly mocked by some literature. In Medusa's legend, the gods and heroes are vile and cowardly. They are just displaying, once again, fear and fawning in the face of might. As long as there is no danger, they are exuberant and courageous towards the weak, and their performance is nothing more than a humiliation of the word hero. They are brave when there is no danger. They are generous when there is no price to pay. It is in shallow stories that they move. It is in the midst of foolish agitations that they are sincere. Awakened Medusa's two sisters, discovering their tragically dead sister, frantically chase after Perseus. But Perseus escapes, wearing a dark helmet that allows him to be invisible, as Hermes instructed him to do. A year after his death, in 1940, Sigmund Freud published his Medusa's Head. In that text's analysis, he argues that the beheading of the snake-haired Medusa symbolizes is the castration of Phapinus. Freud believed that Medusa's horror reflected the young boy's castration complex, and that when he saw female genitalia, he understood the fact that women did not have penises. Medusa's serpentine hair represents the male phallus, as well as the authority of the father. Castration also represents a challenge to patriarchal authority, and it was after castrating the phallus of his father, Uranus, that Cronus became the second main god. The beauty covered by hair also represents the female pubic area at the same time. The gorgeous Medusa also represents the memory of her mother in the Age of Innocence. Looking at her mother, who is imprisoned, with her genitals covered with hair, the subject's illicit desires become rigid and frozen in fear of her father's retaliation. We don't often single out explanations for mythological characters, but the explanation for the fearsome, severed head Medusa is readily available. Severed head equal castration. Medusa's terror is also the fear of castration, associated with seeing something. From many analyzed experiences, we know that this moment occurs when the boys, who until then still did not believe in the threat, have just glimpsed the female genitalia for a few moments. It is highly probable that the adult is entangled in the hair, and that the organ actually belongs to the mother. If Medusa's hairs are often presented as serpentine in works of art, this is because they come from a castration complex. And it is worth noting that whatever horrific results these serpentine hairs cause, they are actually used to minimize the horror because they are used to replace the penis, the absence of which is the cause of the horror. A rule of analysis shows that the numerous representations of castration symbolized by the penis are hereby confirmed.
The sight of Medusa's head causes a man to be so frightened that he cannot move, and the man who sees it turns to stone. This is the same sentiment from castration with the same emotional transformation. Because the rigid immobilization indicates an erection. In this original situation, the viewer is relieved that he still possesses a penis. And the rigid hardening assures him of this. Athena, the goddess of virginity, wore this horrific symbol on her costume. Quite literally, she became inapproachable as a woman, resisting all sexual desires. And she displayed her mother's horrific sexual organs. By and large, the Greeks had strong homosexual tendencies and could not help but present women as horrific and repugnant due to their emasculation. If Medusa's head replaces the presentation of the female sexual organs, and more precisely if it isolates the frightening effect in the creation of pleasure, then we can readily recall that in other situations the presentation of the sexual organs is an act of exorcism. That which frightens oneself also frightens the enemy one is trying to defend oneself against. In Rabelais, we have women presenting their private parts to frighten demons into fleeing. The erection of the male sexual organ also has the effect of warding off evil but by another mechanism. Presenting a penis or any other alternative is to say, I am not afraid of you, I defy you, I have a penis. This is another way to intimidate evil spirits. In order to get a more rigorous confirmation of this interpretation, it is necessary to investigate further in Greek mythology the origin of this isolated, lurid symbol and the circumstances in which it may be contrasted in other myths. Freud further elaborates that Medusa has significance for both boys and girls in terms of fear of sex and cognitive growth. At the same time, Medusa represents the truth, the natural origin of the world. One tries to avoid looking Medusa in the eye because the heart is running away from the depressing reality. I cannot help remembering a remark of De Caceres. It was over the wine in Mucans. Said he, the profoundest instinct in man is to war against the truth, that is, against the real. He shuns facts from his infancy. His life is a perpetual evasion. Miracle, chimera and tomorrow keep him alive. He lives on fiction and myth. It is the lie that makes him free. Animals alone are given the privilege of lifting the veil of the Isis. Men dare not. The animal, awake, has no fictional escape from the real because he has no imagination. Man, awake, is compelled to seek a perpetual escape into hope, belief, fable, art, God, socialism, immortality, alcohol, love. From Medusa Truth, he makes an appeal to Maya Lai. Jack London was an American novelist journalist, and activist, as well as a pioneer of commercial fiction in American magazines. He was later known as an innovator of science fiction. The Isis of his text is a major goddess in ancient Egyptian religion, who was considered the divine mother of the pharaohs, also known as the mistress of life, ruler of fate and destiny. Isis has the ability to predict or influence future events and determine the length and quality of human life. Maya has several meanings in Indian philosophy. In later Vedic texts, Maya connotes a magic show, an illusion where things appear to be present but are not what they seem. The principle shows a tributeless absolute as having attributes. Maya also connotes that which is constantly changing and thus is spiritually unreal. In opposition to an unchanging absolute, or Brahman, and therefore conceals the true character of spiritual reality. In another legend, Medusa prayed to Athena after being raped, begging for forgiveness. Athena didn't punish Medusa and gave Medusa the ability to protect herself from men, so she would never be raped again. And Perseus, seeing Medusa's beauty, virtue, and goodness, was once again ready to rape her. Due to Athena's curse, Perseus is unable to penetrate with his penis, and in his irritation, cuts off her head. Medusa, because of her ability to defend herself, is eventually murdered. As time passes, Medusa has been revealed with multiple meanings. Like most people, as a foil to the heroes, as a victim of heroism, and as a cost in the history of greatness, Medusa represents the destiny of ordinary people, Mirroring the vileness of the Great Ones, Medusa was still gazing at the humans, 
and people have long since gotten used to it, pretending she doesn't exist. Please follow me and subscribe to my channel. Please also share our discussions. I look forward to more people joining us in exploring the theme of human destiny by following in Arno Will's footsteps as documented in ideas and myths.